course, this evening at 6, is Seth tales of ghosts and hauntings at the famous Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs aren't disturbing enough. Well, a landscaper at the hotel recently discovered something pretty creepy buried on the grounds there. It appears they have dug up bottles filled with human body parts. My name is Larry Flaxman. I'm a best-selling author, researcher, paranormal theorist, and filmmaker. For the past 25 years, I've been involved in paranormal research and field investigation with a focus on applying science to unexplained phenomena. This has allowed me to visit and investigate hundreds of incredible locations. One of these incredible locations is the 1886 Crescent Hotel. My first visit to the Crescent Hotel was nearly 30 years ago on a road trip with my parents shortly after we moved to Arkansas. The Crescent left an indelible impression on me, so imagine my surprise when I was asked to be the keynote speaker at their new Parallel Universe event in 2012. This quickly became the precursor to what we now know as the Eureka Springs Paranormal Weekend. In the 10 years since that first invitation, I've had numerous unexplained experiences at the hotel, and I've been a part of the annual ESP event since its inception. I've become so much a part of the Crescent family that I'm now the hotel's resident paranormal investigator. In early 2019, I received a call from hotel management informing me of an intriguing discovery made by the gardener behind the building. Apparently, a bottle dump had been discovered, but what she found were no ordinary bottles. I drove up in the middle of the night and had the incredible honor of helping to dig several of the bottles that were determined to have been on display for years at Norman Baker's Cancer Hospital. Because of the historical significance, the University of Arkansas was called in to conduct a full archaeological survey, and they took numerous bottles and containers back to their lab for analysis. Three years later, the university unfortunately still had not provided any information about the samples, and we were becoming increasingly frustrated by the lack of communication or resolution. During the 2022 ESP weekend in January, I offered to help answer that long-awaited question of what's in those bottles. Hotel management quickly agreed, and I took several bottles, including one containing potential human tissue, back home for analysis. I spent the next six months looking for a pathology lab that could perform the forensic analysis on these 80-plus-year-old samples. The project turned out to be far more difficult than I had anticipated. I was encountering roadblocks at every turn. I was sitting at my desk when a response to one of my dozens of requests arrived in my inbox. Honestly, I was expecting yet another rejection and disappointment. After exhausting nearly all of my options, I finally received a positive response. That long-awaited email came from surgical pathologist Dr. Charles M. Quick, who was intrigued enough by the project to agree to meet with me and see if these samples were viable or had degraded too much due to the passage of time or their unfavorable storage conditions. So my name is Matt Quick. Uh, I'm a surgical pathologist, uh, which means I specialize in the analysis of tissue, uh, surgical specimens mainly. Uh, so my daily clinical practice consists of kind of analyzing uh, tissue that comes out of patients or off of patients and kind of relaying information back to their doctors to tell them about uh, the diagnosis that they may or may not have. Um, I've been doing this since, oh golly, about 2005. Um, I started uh, in my current role uh, in about 2010 and have been doing it ever since. Uh, I specialize in women's oncology. Uh, so mainly uh, specialize in, in diseases of the you know, genital tract in women. Uh, think uterine cancer, cervical cancer, things like that. Uh, so that's kind of my area of expertise. Uh, but uh, me and many of my partners here, we actually practice general surgical pathology as well. And so we see specimen from all over the human body, um, which has kind of led to our interaction, actually, um, as you had some pretty interesting stuff to look at. I did. Um, so do you want to talk about how we met or yeah. how, how I ended up here in your office with you? Yeah. Um, well, no, so I was, uh, I was actually at a meeting initially. And so I was at a meeting and I got an email from, from Jim. And, and he said, Jim is one of the managers that works down in the lab. And he said, we got this really interesting email from a guy that might have tissue uh, from the Crescent Hotel. 
do you know anything about this? And I was like, well, I, I don't know anything about a man with tissue. No, I do know about the Crescent Hotel and the tissue at the Crescent Hotel. So send him my way. I would love to talk to him. Turned out to be you. And, um, you know, after meeting and, and looking at the tissue, uh, was rather pleasantly surprised uh, by the accuracy of that initial email. Yeah. So. And yeah. I, I definitely have to say I am very appreciative Um for you taking the time to do this. Um, I, I literally contacted every pathology lab that I could find, a private pathology lab, uh, and I reached out to basically every resource that I had, and I was turned down at every uh, every route. So I really appreciate Oh, no, um, it's, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Well, and, and you know, I, I, I shared some of the tissue, some of the things that we... Uh, saw with several other colleagues in the department, everybody was, you know, really interested to to look at it and, and to see, um, you know, that's one of the benefits of being an academic surgical pathologist mm -hmm. is that there is some leeway for us to kind of follow uh, interesting leads and things like this uh, that impact our community. And it's important to us that we be able to do that. So what was your first thought um, when you actually saw the, t the suspected tissue for the first time? What, what did you think? Well, so, you know, my skeptical self, you, you know, knowing the stories, you think, oh, well, this could be some kind of, of, of animal tissue or, or maybe not even tissue, just pieces of rubber or something. And then when it came out of the jar, immediately, you know, I kind of recognized it as, as, as blood clot. Because we had this discussion, you know, oh, this kind of looks like a blood clot. Um, it has a very rubbery kind of consistency, and it's not something that you can really easily recreate, um, you know, with artificial materials. And so it did look biologic, which was, you know, both pleasantly surprising and somewhat shocking at the same time. F relatively well preserved, too. Not sure what was in the bottle, um, but um, whatever it was, uh, you know, the way that it was preserved uh, actually kept it pretty well. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that seeing that initially was kind of surprising. And then, you know, of course, when we were making the cuts uh, into it, it, it cut kind of like a tissue would. And of course, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that, oh, well, this is definitely human tissue at that point. Uh, but what it does tell me is that, you know, we're actually dealing with, uh, you know, real tissue as opposed to some kind of, you know, fake rubber compound or something that you could use to fool people. Right. So yeah. kind of walk me through um, the pathology process. Um, so when I brought the samples to you, kind of explain a little bit of, about the methodology of how uh, you collected the samples, mm -hmm. how, you, uh, how you then analyze the samples, and then we'll, we'll get to the interpretation in a little sure. bit. Sure. So, the, you know, the way that we do that is it's really a, a multi-part process. The first part, of course, is using our eyes, fingers, noses uh, sometime to kind of mm -hmm. uh, evaluate what you're kind of what you're holding in your hand and so when you're looking at this tissue you know I'm feeling it you feel the rubbery consistency it kind of tells you oh that this could be clotted blood as opposed to something that would be hard like bone or tough and rubbery like muscle uh, and after a while you kind of get used to feeling these different textures and so uh, then we cut the tissue up and look at it. And what you're looking for is anything that stands out, you know, little tan spots, white flecks, any differences in color, consistency, texture. Uh, and then anytime you see that difference, you would want to take little pieces of it, and which is what we did, you know, several of the different areas from kind of across the tissue specimen, we submit that in and we process it using some different chemicals, which fixes it further, uh, kind of firms it up, if you will, dehydrates the tissue, uh, makes it easy to cut very, very thin. And so we take the tissue, uh, they embed it in wax, and then we cut that tissue, you know, about the thickness of a human hair or half a human hair, but to where it's basically transparent, uh, put it on a glass slide uh, and stain it uh, with chemicals, uh, which you can see in the pictures behind me, which turn certain things pink, certain things purple, certain things shades of blue, uh, et cetera. That actually allows us to see it because again, it's so thin that if you shine light through it, you, you don't really see anything. It's a ghosted image. Uh, so that stain allows us to actually look at the cells that make up the tissue. And then that's what we do uh, on our microscopes uh, is that we then look at the stained tissue and say, okay, you know, this is made up of this kind of cell or that kind of cell, or there are no cells here. This is only, you know, 
clotted blood or something like that. Um, so that's kind of the general process that we go through in preparing really any specimen, um, but you know this one uh, as well. So as you're going through the process of of fixing it and getting it ready for um, analysis, are there are you taking bets on what you're going to find? Are you are you always able, are you always okay? <laughs> always. I mean, we and anyone that tells you otherwise is lying. We're always guessing as to what this is. Always, you know. In fact, I think if you go back and you look at my initial reaction to it, it was like, oh, this is clotted blood. I think yeah. that that's that bet. I mean, and so that bet definitely occurs. Not only that, we bet with each other, um, you know, and we also keep score with ourselves to see how often we're right. It, it's just kind of the fun of the game, right? You know. Um, not that, not that I'm comparing myself to Michael Jordan, but he kept track of how many points he scored. We keep track of how many things we can identify just by looking at it kind of up here. It's a little part of the game we play. So there, yes, there were bets placed. <laughs> Hopefully you won. I, well, I would say, you know, based on the, the images I saw, yeah, it was a win. It was a win. So blood clot was involved, so I wasn't completely off base. But th there was bonus material, right? And it's the bonus material that makes the job so fun and fulfilling is that when you find something unexpected, that changes everything. And so there were some unexpected findings that we were able to pull out of, you know, looking at the material microscopically. There really did kind of push things over the edge, if you will. Right. And you were not expecting to find those extraneous <laughs> things at all. Not, not in the least. And, and, you know, the things that you find, we use those clues on a daily basis when we're doing our clinical work. Uh, often, you know, when we teach residents, medical students, uh, you know, we tell them, use all the clues that are available to you to come to the diagnosis, right? So we'll often look through patient charts. We'll look at their labs. We'll look at the histology of the tissue. Um, you know, and we synthesize all that material together because that's how you get your best answer, mm -hmm. right? So just looking at it and say, well, this looks like a blood clot, that would have been a good answer, but it wasn't the best answer. The best answer actually came in once we looked under the microscope and started to see some things. What did you see? <laughs> so, you know, the first things first, there was definitely some blood clot, but the interesting thing beyond that was that there was a fiber connective tissue. Think um, basically what's underneath your skin, if you will. Uh, so not so much the skin itself, but the, the tissue that makes your skin full, the mm -hmm. connective tissue that lays underneath, often known as like the dermis. Uh, there was also some muscle under there. And so what that says is that this is definitely biologic, right? Um, so you're dealing with what we'd say is connective tissue stroma and muscle. Um, so, you know, again, this is some kind of animal tissue, um, and that was somewhat unexpected. I was thinking this could just be blood clot, which in and of itself is, is animal tissue as well. It's just kind of a specific type, but this shows you that this was removed specifically for a purpose because otherwise you wouldn't have muscle, you wouldn't have connective tissue. That stuff doesn't fall off. You, you cut that off, right? Um, so then it starts to take the, the look of a wound, right? So you have a um, and any, anybody that's seen like a bed sore or a pressure ulcer or something like that, that's what we call those things commonly, um, that's the kind of wound that you're looking at, which would be a shallow wound that erodes through the skin uh, that exposes the underlying tissue. And that's actually what we found under the microscope. Um, but that wasn't all that we found. So but at this point, though, the, the clues are sort of adding up. Right. right? You're starting to, to get more and more pieces of the puzzle together. Exactly, exactly. Because knowing the little bits of history that I knew, um, you know, about the tissue and in specifics, what they were seeing at the Crescent was that, you know, they were treating cancer without doing surgery. So how do you end up with a jar of tissue, right? That doesn't really track. Um, this isn't cancer tissue. This is, this is disease tissue. This is infected tissue. This is a wound, if you will. Um, and so that part of it actually starts to make more sense because if you're finding cancer tissue in a bottle in a place that says we don't do surgery to cre treat cancer, your first thought is, well, yeah, you are. You're just hiding it in the front yard. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. Um, this was more in line with just regular surgical debridement of a wound, which is insanely common in bedridden patients. 
right? And especially when we're talking about the dates that we're talking about, um, because we didn't have the technology back then to, pre to prevent these wounds as well as we do now. And so that, that, that's a clue. That's, again, you have to look at the time frame we're dealing with. You have to look at what surgical tools and techniques were, were available to them. You know, how were things treated uh, back in this time frame? And that, that becomes very important. So, so what else did you find? So there, it, there were some additional um, pieces of the puzzle right, right. that sort of lend to, to kind of a singular answer here, but what, what were some of the more unique um, foreign materials mm -hmm. uh, so that this, you discovered? Yeah, and then, so what you're touching on is the real kicker here, right? And I, it kinda, I like holding back that information just to make it slightly more fun <laughs> on my part because the daily grind gets a little old sometimes. But the, the real kicker here was we discovered cotton fibers. Uh, cotton fibers? Cotton fibers. Like you'd find in, in a Q-tip. Gauze. Instance, or yeah, gauze. gauze. Yeah, cotton gauze, which, okay. I mean, you know, has been around for, for ages, right? And you use cotton gauze to, to pack wounds. Right, and so one of the things that you would, so and again, we're starting to layer this, right? So we start with the superficial wound. It has the underlying connective tissue. Great, well, what did they do to pack these, what did they do to treat these wounds You know, before surgery? You wouldn't always just cut this off immediately, right? Well, you pack it with cotton gauze, usually soaked in some kind of anti antiseptic material, right? And that would theoretically maybe stop bacteria from growing in the wound and, and maybe help it to heal. It doesn't always work, especially if the wound is bad, then you progress to surgery. So what do you do? You pack the wound with gauze. Well, we found evidence of gauze within the wound. Is that process or procedure still used today? Yeah, we still, to this day, that's, you know, that's how we treat uh, these, what we'd call a secondary intention wound, which is a wound that we don't suture together right? So a wound that you leave open that then heals slowly over time, right? Um, so one of these wounds, we would still, to this day, take medicated gauze, we would pack it, we'd change it on a regular basis, irrigate the wound, keep things clean, and help it to heal on its own while preventing infection. And this is very similar to what was happening uh, even when this theoretical patient was being treated. Um, we just have better tools now. Uh, but in addition to the gauze, uh, one of the things that really just sealed the deal was the presence of vegetable matter. And so, you know, vegetable matter, what does that mean? Well, I mean stool is what I mean. There was poop in the wound. And you say, well, that's kind of gross. You know, how would poop get in a wound? That's disgusting. What are they doing? Well, you have to think about these, you know, again, this relates back to common, common human things, right? When we're in incapacitated settings, right? When a patient's incapacitated, they, they would sit in a bed and they would get bed sores. And where do they get bed sores? Classically right at the top of their butt, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's because you sit up a little bit and that's where all the pressure is and it leads to breakdown of the skin. These patients that are often bedridden, they have accidents and you gotta clean them up. Um, but it's not easy. Anybody that's, uh, you know, I was a nurse's aide way back in the day uh, before I got into this field. And I can tell you from experience that taking care of, you know, demented patients, sick patients that are bedridden is very difficult and assuring absolute cleanliness is very difficult. And so it's not uncommon for these wounds, these pressure sores that happen on the sacrum of a patient that's sitting in a very uncomfortable bed for long periods of time to get contaminated uh, with stool. This happens now, right? This happens even now in 2022. Uh, this is something we deal with. 50, 60, 70 years ago, it happened way more often because again, the beds weren't as good, right? They were just pretty, they were basically cots with mattresses on them. Um, now we have these inflatable beds and, you know, patients get turned all these certain times. That didn't happen as much back then. So patients suffered from more decubitus ulcers. Uh, we didn't have the technology to have them call people when they needed assistance in using the restroom and things like that, right? As well as we have now, we have pager systems and all this other stuff. Um, so patients often got bed sores, got contaminated bed sores, and contaminated bed sores with stool, you really can't treat that with, you know, medicinal soaked gauze, right? You, you have to cut that out. So what happened, in my opinion, was that this bed sore got infected and was cut out. 
um, in order to attempt to help the patient heal. Again, this has nothing to do with cancer therapy, cancer treatment, or anything other than if you can imagine someone very sick with cancer being treated would be bedridden. So this is just basic care. This is basic care, right? This is something that happens to patients that are in the hospital for long periods of time um, that you have to treat because if you don't, they could get septic and die. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is outside of the realm of cancer care per se, but it is part of what you would do to take care of a patient that had been inpatient in a hospital, in a bed, for a long period of time. And so you say long period, a couple weeks or more, um, but pressure source can, can uh, set in pretty quickly, uh, especially you know, if the patient's not moved around very often. So vegetable material, cotton, and then the actual wound. The wound itself, yes. What does that lead you to, to believe that this was? So, I mean, you know, in looking at this again, putting all of it together, knowing the location, knowing the time period, knowing what was happening at this location, um, you know, I think it's, it's very reasonable to say that you're looking at tissue from a patient that was inpatient at that hospital, um, tissue that had to be removed because it became an infected wound, um, and so they cut it and, and kept it. You know, why they kept it in the manner they kept it, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm glad they did because if they wouldn't have, then we would have never seen it. Um, but what it does show is that, you know, there were people there. Uh, there were people there that had common complications to being an inpatient in a hospital setting and that they were being treated. Um, you know, arguably with standard of care therapy at that point in time, too. I mean, that's what you would do for someone with a bed sore. Um, if not, they could very easily die from that before they could die from their cancer. Um, what do you think would be the motivation for creating a sample such as this? Would it be, you think, for simply showmanship, or do you, is there, would there be a medical rationale for, for doing this? So, you know, Part of it is the practice of what we do. Um, so amazingly enough, um, you know, if we were go, to go down to uh, the pathology lab here, um, you would see rows and rows and rows of buckets of specimen. Um, and we keep those. Um, we don't keep them <laughs> for decades. We do keep them for months. And part of the reason for that is if we ever need to go back to that specimen and retest it for something else, say something else is discovered and you say, oh, we should maybe go back and look at, you know, X, Y, or Z to see if there was a link, something we missed, or maybe another piece of evidence that we could use to help this patient out. Um, so it, it, it is common practice to retain a specimen uh, for a certain period of time. Um, you know, whether that was the practice that they were employing at, at the Crescent, um, who knows, right? Now, I would suspect that the way it was displayed with the bottle and everything, that there was a certain element of maybe showmanship, right? Yeah. Um, because, you know, ours, you can't see right through the, it's in an opaque plastic bucket. It's not very cool looking or any of that stuff. Right. And this looked kind of cool looking, like someone would want to show it off, right? Especially given some of the other artifacts that were found, you kind of think that it might have been part of a, you know, display that says, look, you know, look at, you know, look at what we're doing here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, glad that they did it because it's evidence of kind of routine clinical care too. Um, even if you're not providing excellent cancer care at a place like that, the fact that you're still taking care of the patients to an extent and making sure that they don't die from other more common things, you know, shows a certain level of knowing what you're doing, compassion, right. I mean, you know, things that, that... there is some medical expertise. That there is some medical oversight, right? Yeah. Because, you know, you hear some of the lore, the legends, and you think, golly, I wonder what they really were doing to patients. But there's some evidence there that people were being taken care of, at least in one way that was standard of care. Now, maybe not the other way, um, but, you know, if you're an open-minded person, you, you look at clinical trials nowadays and you say, you know what, we still experiment with drugs on patients to see if it cures them, you know, and that's part of clinical cancer trials for patients now and it's a necessary part of medicine.
So, you know, if you want to take a really positive spin on the entire thing, it, it could be somewhat groundbreaking that this is in a way kind of like an evidence of a very early clinical trial. Well, again, I really appreciate everything that you've done. And Happy to um, I know the Crescent is, is very thankful as well. well. It's a great place. Sp spent many happy weekends there. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to give back 